right, everyone. I am here with Michael McCourt. Michael is the head of engineering at SIGOPT. Michael, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Thank you, Sam. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to our chat. Uh, we, of course, have chatted and met multiple times uh, in person, typically, uh, but we haven't had the opportunity to get you on the show yet. That is changing now. To get us started, I'd love to have you introduce yourself to our audience. Absolutely. How, what's your story? How'd you get started in the field? You know, I, uh, I've been very fortunate. I'm very fortunate to be here uh, today uh, because when I started out, I was actually not doing ML at all. I was doing mathematics. And uh, I did an undergrad and a graduate degree uh, in mathematics undergrad uh, at the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. Uh, grad school at uh, Cornell. And then as part of my graduate program, I actually had an opportunity to work at Argonne National Labs, uh, which is where I really got started doing a lot of uh, high performance computing, some heavy duty writing software, uh, which was a, a great opportunity to learn how to write software as part of a big project, a project a lot of pe other people are contributing to, and most of it has been written before you even got there, uh, which has been great prep for the work that I'm doing now. Uh, after I finished a, a postdoc, also still doing mathematics, a friend of mine, Scott Clark, who, who founded the company Sigopt, reached out and said, Mike, started a company and we're working on the same topic that you've been doing research on for a while. Now, I didn't appreciate that at the time because I had just been doing in what in my mind was sort of pure mathematics or, or applied mathematics. I often referred to myself as a theoretically applied mathematician in the sense that I hope somebody applies it, but it's not going to be me. And then I had the opportunity really to take it and put it to use here as part of my time at SIGOPT. Uh, where we've been uh, using some of the, the kernel methods and, and Gaussian processes work that I had been working on uh, for more of the mathematics and the computational statistics side. And now I'm seeing it also put to work in the uh, ML perspective and uh, having, having this new technology available to our customers so that they can have uh, sort of as good an experience as possible. So my own journey is a sort of a weird one, but uh, I'm so, 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 so fortunate to be here and be able to work with uh, such amazing people and meet outstanding people in the ML community, such as yourself, Sam. Awesome, awesome. So Mike, one of the conversation topics that I wanted to jump in with you is this broad topic of optimization. Uh, you spent a lot of time working on that uh, as does SIGOP broadly. And one of the questions that um, maybe a place to start is, you know, how do you think about optimization relative to machine learning? Optimization is obviously a part of machine learning, but it's also a standalone technique. How do you think about the differences between these techniques and when and where they're applied? Very, very intricate there. I think there's a lot of interplay between a lot of different uh, elements. Uh, at its core, I think some people might argue that machine learning is a uh, branch or a segment of statistical learning theory in, in sort of its core genesis. I think you can also argue that nowadays machine learning also has obviously this very strong engineering element to it. We're talking about the flow of data, data structures, uh, the ability to deal with uh, not just noisy data, but somehow data which, which is beyond the scope of the core assumptions in statistical learning theory. So as a result, I think there are uh, a variety of even different ways to just talk about machine learning as its, as its own entity. And then in addition to that, you throw in the topic of optimization. I think on one hand, there was a famous paper, if I recall correctly, learning to learn by gradient descent. And, and that sort of was a, a, a cute play on words, but, but was a fundamental point of discussion there. A lot of the time when we talk about many of these machine learning methods, not all of them, but many of them, we ask ourselves, can we learn this, not just with the model, but with gradient descent? So when we talk about uh, learning 
at all. In a sense, what we are talking about is gradient descending our way sometimes down to an answer. Now, that's not necessarily required. Of course, we could look at, uh, let's say, uh, li linear logistic regression. There may be a closed form solution to that in, in a classical sense. I don't know if anybody would still use that in a, a very large data setting, but that definitely exists. Uh, when we talk about support vector machines, we might talk about uh, quadratic programming. Quadratic programming is optimization, but it's not necessarily gradient descent, or maybe there's gradient descent mechanism for solving a quadratic program, but usually there's another mechanism for it. So there are, I think, a variety of ways just to talk about optimization in as much as it supports the process of learning. And then to push that a step further, of course, when I talk about optimization in the context of SIGOPT, that's even another step beyond mathematical programming, uh, beyond gradient-based optimization strategies. What we're thinking about inside SIGOPT when we say the words optimization or sample efficient optimization, what we're talking about really are, are problems where we have no knowledge of the structure of the problem. To do mathematical programming, you have to have a, a solid knowledge of the structure, maybe that it's quadratic or, or that the constraints fit a specific format. Uh, in a gradient-based setting, you need that gradient information, or at least an approximation to it. Whereas when we're thinking about optimization here, uh, it's it's more of a an aspiration. We're sort of saying, I aspire to find the optimum, but I don't, I don't actually have any delusions of finding the optimum in any sort of finite or reasonable amount of time. The goal for us when we do optimization is to try and identify as high a performing outcome as possible in as rapid a fashion as possible, but without necessarily any real guarantees of performance. Now, there are some great articles that are talking about uh, performance guarantees or regret minimization for Bayesian optimization. There's some fantastic papers. I think the ICML uh, 2020 test of time paper, 2021 test of time paper this year was uh, the article talking about uh, defining regret in a Bayesian optimization setting through the bandit literature. So I think that there is uh, an opportunity to do that, but from a practical circumstance, when we talk about optimization for what we are doing, we're not talking about optimization for the purposes of learning an ML model. What we're usually talking about is optimization maybe for this tuning process, and in addition to that, optimization that uses learning itself to, to power the optimization process. I mean, internally inside of a Bayesian optimization algorithm, you probably have a Gaussian processes at play or, or maybe a neural network that you're using your modeling on. Obviously, these need to be learned. There's information theory, perhaps, that's powering the acquisition function element of your Bayesian function, Bayesian optimization. But in reality, uh, what I sort of think of this as is more just an, an intelligent search process, an intelligent learning process, learning about the optimum. So yeah, it definitely is doing learning, but when we talk about optimization, it is very different than this gradient-based optimization that I think many people in the community would think of when they first think of optimization. And you weren't lying when you said there was an intricate relationship between those. Uh, we've got optimization, which is used in the context of machine learning as part of the process of learning, we've got optimization, which is uh, separate from machine learning in the sense of we're trying to identify an optimal solution to some problem that we don't have as much information about as we might if we were doing applying machine learning. Uh, and then we've got machine learning embedded into the optimization process to try to optimize <laughs> it in a yeah. sense. I mean, very realistically, um, yeah, that's what's happening. <laughs> I guess it's 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 no surprise then that it is a bit confusing um, in that at least this word optimization is, you know, overloaded in, yes. in a lot of different ways. Uh, you mentioned in there one aspect of optimization that SIGOPT has spent a lot of time on, and that's uh, you know specifically as applied to the hyperparameters in a machine learning problem. Um, but you also 
are increasingly doing other types of optimization, like in a you know HPC style. Is that and what are those and those types of problems are? Uh, I think one that I've talked about previously with uh, Gustavo on your team. An example of that is like identifying the best materials. It was a it was a piece of glass. It was trying to come up with the right materials with which to additively manufacture a special type of glass. And, right. and I think yeah, it was for solar, like for solar power. Or solar exactly or right. Or uh, these right. these optoelectronic devices. It doesn't have to be solar. Your cell phone okay. theoretically is using this as well. But yeah, you're exactly right. Got it. Got it. And so, you know, maybe from kind of a, you know, optimization 101 perspective when we're, you know, we've got, you know, a problem and we can contextualize it in the context of this materials problem, or if you've got a kind of a simpler context, conceptual problem for us to start with, um, you know, how, how, how do folks typically start when they're thinking about an optimization problem and kind of what's the, the path of, uh, you know, maybe increasing complexity, like what's the simplest approach? And then, you know, wh where do you go from there to try to do a better job? I think, it starts with a uh, initial formulation of what it is that's trying to be addressed. And when I say that, I mean that it's actually maybe two different parts of the formulation. There's the initial formulation, which is the, the physical world, the physical manifestation, whatever it is you're working on, whether it is manufacturing something like a, like a coffee cup or whether it is designing an ML algorithm that you're going to put into production to give recommendations. Uh, both of these require an initial statement of what is it that we're trying to accomplish and what is it that we're willing to do in order to accomplish that. Uh, if, if we were willing to have some brilliant artisan come in and design this mug and spend hours crafting each one, that's very different than, hey, I need to get 10 million of these manufactured at any given time. The same thing is true realistically of an ML algorithm as well. If you're willing to spend years and years and years building these up, that's very different than, hey, we need this to get out in three weeks. And we need it not just to get out, but we need to be in production and be stable and be monitored and feel confident that we're not you know, really hurting our business here. So I think that that's sort of the first side of uh, stating this, this formulation and, and explaining the world in which you're willing to live. And then the second step is the actual, to some degree, phrasing of the problem as an optimization problem. What metric or potentially metrics is it that you're interested in considering in this situation? What domain, how is it that you can parameterize this space of decisions that you're willing to make? And to some degree also, what is your your budget here? And when I say budget, it could be a financial budget. It could be a time budget. It could be a expert's time budget. So, so both of these elements are, I think, key to, to progressing the problem forward. And once that uh, initial discussion has taken place with not just the person who's being assigned or people who are being assigned to do the modeling, but also whoever the stakeholders are in this, whoever going to make the final decision, yeah, this can, this can be a winner or no, it can't be a winner. They all need to agree. And ideally that all kind of happens at the start, because if you wait until the end, you might've wasted three weeks, three months, three years trying to build something that people actually decide isn't acceptable. And so you've got this uh, problem formulation and when I hear the way you describe that, I'm thinking like English, you know, or a natural language more properly and like in a document as opposed to a mathematical formulation of the problem. Is that what you're describing? Is I think that's the split there between the two formula. I think on one hand, you need to have an agreement and maybe formula formulation is honestly probably the wrong word, which again... I think even the optimization community sometimes uses optimization too broadly. I'm probably using formulation too broadly here. But yeah, on one hand, you need the English language document. You need a bunch of people who aren't going to be knee deep in the project to still agree with the goals of the project and allocate the necessary resources. But then you also do need to some degree, this rigorous mathematical formulation. You need to be able to compute things. If you have things you can't compute, 
if you have things you can't measure, it's going to be very hard to uh, optimize them. Not necessarily impossible. We can talk about that a little bit later, but I think it's, it's an ill-defined situation if you go forward and try to not uh, have very explicit statement of these are the metrics I'm studying, at the very least studying. Uh, if you can't state that, it's going to be very hard to, to feel confident that you're you're doing things successfully. And and so in the case of the the glass or the mug, do you you've got some property that you want to optimize, uh, and you've got some set of parameters that influence that property. I don't imagine that you always have a straight line mathematical equation between those parameters and the the ultimate property that you're trying to optimize. Very rarely, very rarely. Very and when rarely. you do, you probably have some very nice, clean way to try and do the optimization. Right. Um, I'll say that there's a few different sets of circumstances that can pop up here. Mm -hmm. uh, the relationship between these parameters, these choices you can make, and the resulting metrics of interest to you uh, is, is in some sense always defined by a physical outcome. I build the mug, I drop the mug on the ground, I watch whether it cracks or not. Mm -hmm. uh, much more often, you're going to see people using some sort of computational simulation to help accelerate mm -hmm. the process uh, because... Uh, presumably running something on the computer is going to be faster than actually manufacturing, fabricating whatever device or tool or object that it is. Not always, uh, but usually. And that's why, of course, people are buying more and more computers and, and moving more and more of their testing process into the computational world. As far as understanding this relationship between choices you can make and resulting metrics, it's... Uh, Sometimes you have a great insight into this as an expert, as somebody who's been working in the field for 20, 30 years. Sometimes you don't. And sometimes even if you do, you want to get beyond your intuition because your intuition got you to where you are now. If you're trying to do something new, somehow you, you, you need to get beyond where you would initially naturally be guided to act and the decisions you'd naturally be guided to make. And I think that that's a key element of what's the uh, sort of mathematical and statistical formulation of optimization brings to the table is you can leverage your prior beliefs, your prior sense of the world if you, if you want to, but you also can drown that out. The computer doesn't have to have any prior beliefs about things. So the computer, the optimization algorithm will figure out whatever it can figure out. And that can expose you to some new ideas, some new strategies, which are I think what, what everybody's really trying to go after when they're building uh, a new model, when they're designing a new coffee mug or the glass, for example. And, and really, I think one of the interesting things about that project was it wasn't a one metric problem. There wasn't one objective we were interested in. There were actually a lot of objectives of interest. And the relationship between the, the parameters and the metrics were complicated. And then the metrics themselves, of course, competed with each other. One of the key metrics we were interested in studying there, we need the glass to be low haze. Light has to pass through and not get scattered, which obviously if the light gets scattered, you're not going to be able to see what's on the other side of the glass. So light that's coming in from the sun might not actually be as efficient in the solar panel, or you're not going to be able to see what your phone is trying to show you. But on the other side of that, you want the glass to be very easy to clean, which was this term super omniphobic glass. We don't want oil or sand in the case of solar panels, oil in the case of your fingerprints on your computer screen. You don't want that sticking to the glass. And if it does touch the glass, you want it to be wiped right off very quickly, not to need some very harsh astringent to get it off of the solar panels. But these things are at odds. I mean, when you think to yourself, what sort of thing does oil not stick to? Gee, a, a cooking pan. Could I make my phone out of a cooking pan, Teflon? No, obviously you can't do that. So when you try to maximize one metric, you're hurting the other metric. And that sort of balance, that understanding, the exploration of how the decisions you make demand these trade-offs in your resulting models or your resulting solar panels or whatever, uh, that's a really key part of what I'd call the, the modern optimization process or maybe the modern intelligent experimentation process. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So you, you've, you've formulated your problem, identified the things you care about uh, and your constraints. You've identified the relationship as best you can between the, you know, the, the knobs and dials you have and the, the quantities that you care about. Uh, and then I'm imagining the next step is, you know, some type of optimization approach and, and maybe the easiest one is like, Hey, we'll just try, you know, every value of every knob and write down what the outputs are and like, see where we get, but that is quite expensive. And so then we get some more sophisticated approach. That's the crux of the problem. There it is. No, but I think, I think you've hit, you've hit the nail squarely on the head. At the end of the day, if you want to find out what works best, try a bunch of things, whichever works the best is the winner. And realistically, that will work. That absolutely will work. And every day of the week, people do this all the time. How do you pick the toothpaste you like the best? I don't know about you. I try this toothpaste. I try this toothpaste. I try this. Eventually one of them I like, and I'm like, okay, I'll take that toothpaste. That's fine. I think that that strategy is a perfectly reasonable strategy in certain circumstances. But as we get to these more complicated decision spaces, as we get to a point where we're trying to design a coffee mug, now we're talking about not just the shape, but we're also talking about maybe the material. We're talking about uh, how hot it's put into the fire for. We're talking about the color on the outside. You're talking about increasingly complicated space. You just can't try them all. You absolutely cannot try them all. So you need some intelligent strategy to search the space. And in particular, the way that strategy is going to be intelligent is by figuring out whatever relationships exist between the parameters you're studying and the metric that you're interested in optimizing. And that's really the difficult point. You mentioned earlier, could somebody go through and define this relationship? Absolutely. The answer, maybe that is possible. But in most circumstances, that's not going to be possible for all sorts of reasons. Most of these objectives are very noisy. In most of these problems, you have some limited amount of precision with which you can set these parameters. In reality, the metric you're trying to optimize is probably not the metric that you are doing the optimization on. If I run a computer simulation for something, I'm doing pretty well as far as approximating the real world, but it's not the real world. Right? And when I go through to actually manufacture it, or when I go through to actually put my model in production tomorrow or the day after, tomorrow and the day after are going to act differently than today. So even if I have the best data possible, it's just not going to be possible to actually optimize the thing that I'm trying to study. So as a result, we're going to need to move as quickly as we can in our optimization process so that we can figure out the best thing for today and then retune in the future, as new information pops up, as new strategies pop up, as I want to design something different, because it turns out customer tastes have changed. All of these things are key elements in what is going to be a successful optimization process. And what we do internally, and what many of these Bayesian optimization methods use, is some sort of modeling strategy, as we talked about, basically ML on the inside, to come up with what this relationship between parameters and metrics are. The better we can understand that relationship, the more quickly we can point ourselves towards where the high performing outcomes are. I want to maybe take a digress for a, a second, kind of returning back to the earlier a conversation around machine learning versus optimization as approaches to to solving a particular problem. Does is optimization something that you might apply when you you know haven't collected as much historical data relative to machine learning, or is that not does that not have anything to do with it? Ultimately, when you know, you're trying to, to build the, the mug that has the, the strength that you want, given whatever your constraints, you know, there's some parameters that you're trying to figure out that optimize the strength and whatever other targets you have. What is it that, that says that you shouldn't try to machine learn those parameters? Rather, you should optimize 
uh, and find those parameters that way. It is, it is very much this desire for sample efficiency. And you could absolutely test one design, the next design, the next design, the next design. You could try and do this uh, for, for 4,000 times, 8,000 times, 50,000 times, Got however it. many times it would take. To, to, to learn your, whatever it is, XG boost model, neural network, whatever. And then of course, once you have an XG boost model, neural network, optimizing that, finding the optimal value for, for that is very, very cheap because evaluating an XG boost model, neural network, support vector, evaluating that's very cheap. The key here is that the cost of each piece of data is so high. So it's the same thing. It's Please. the same thing it always is with machine learning. You need a label data set. Oh, very says, true. Very true. These are your these are your inputs. Yes. This is your strength. You know, this is your whatever. Those are your out the your your labels. Yes. Um, and for the types of physical world problems that we're talking about primarily, you just don't have that. Exactly. Or or and if so, you do, it's very small. It's a very small set, and you don't have the amount of time required to make a very large data right. set yeah right. exactly right. right forgive me that should have been obvious but it wasn't falling no 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 no. that's a that's a great point and let me tie that in with a small branch of machine i shouldn't say small branch but a branch of machine learning called active learning mm -hmm. active learning is very much uh a key driving mm -hmm. force behind bayesian optimization Right. Uh, in an active learning setting, you are trying to do machine learning on this relationship between parameters and metrics, but you're doing it in such a way that you acquire each piece of data sort of in a sequential fashion or maybe in batches, but you don't have all the data at the start. You're trying to accumulate more data. The goal there, though, is to exactly as you're talking about, learn this model. The goal in Bayesian optimization is to sequentially accumulate data, but not to learn the model, only to learn about the optimum or high performing outcomes. Mm. Even if our internal models are very bad, it doesn't matter as long as they're pointing us in the right direction, as long as they're identifying high performing outcomes. The model itself could actually be garbage just totally terrible, totally useless, not predictive in any fashion, as long as it points you in the right direction. And that's, I think, the key benefit of applying Bayesian optimization as opposed to, let's say, active learning, is that you have a different goal. If your goal is a simpler goal, find the optimum. That's simpler than learn the whole function over the whole domain. And you can do it in a more sample efficient fashion because of that. Uh, th that that was super helpful. I'm remembering back to my conversation with Gustavo. I don't remember if it was if this was part of the published interview or a, a prior a pre call, um, but I remember not really not really understanding the connection with active learning and thinking that it was a bit of a stretch. Like, yeah, or just not like is that kind of a marketing association or like what's the relationship between optimization and, and active learning. But what you said just uh, helped kind of frame that for me with, in both cases, you're kind of doing sequential, uh, you know, optimization estimate. You're, you're, tr you're trying to go from your inputs to your outputs sequentially and evaluating how close you got to where you're trying to go. Um, and, feeding them back to help you determine where to go next. And in the active learning case, your goal is to create a model that you can then take and uh, apply independent of this incremental process. In your optimization case, you just want the values at the end that tell you, you know, what to go try in the real world. Exactly right. No, you've, you've nailed it. And, and these aren't the, they're, I think they're very closely related communities. I think the people who are doing active learning are very closely related to the people who are doing optimization. I think there's a, a minor offshoot of active learning, this active search topic uh, that, that Roman Garnett has been working on for a little bit, which is like optimization, except that your metric is not numerical. It's a zero one metric. So all you're trying to find is the, the highest number of successes possible. Um, you, you might hear people talk about every once in a while active differential inference. I need to be able to understand the state of the world in as sample, of fashion, of fa sample efficient fashion 
uh, as possible. In particular, this pops up sometimes in medical diagnostics. If you're running a test on somebody, especially let's say a test that has some sort of radiological element to it, you want to do so in as sample efficient a fashion as possible. Uh, you can use these active differential inference methods for this. There's a, a field called Bayesian quadrature. That's the active estimation of integrals through exactly the same way. Let me accumulate some data. Let me do so in a way which gets me the most accurate integral, the most accurate understanding of the world as fast as possible. The only question is, what's your goal? Is it learning? Is it optimization? Is it inference? Is it quadrature? Is it search? These are all parts of, in my mind, the same spoke. Now, could you say that this is all strongly related to sequential decision making and, and in particular, the, the topic uh, sequential decision making make the in the real world. I would argue yes. Some people in the sequential decision making community may argue no. Reinforcement learning is a different thing, and so I think that in reality, I think that many of these things are are closely related, but they do have practical enough differences, perhaps that they're certainly worthy of of study in and of themselves. I don't think there's any need to, to merge all of these topics, but I do think that. Knowing about the literature in each of these fields has helped each of these fields progress uh, faster than they would if they were just cloistered off on their own. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we're starting to get to where I hope we hoped we would get to, which is kind of like the you know, we've defined optimization, kind of framed it relative to machine learning, and we're starting to talk about like what's the research frontier and optimization what are the open questions i mean optimization is w way older than machine learning right um and so it's a much more mature field um beyond kind of mentioning you know some adjacent areas like you did is there a way for you to characterize like what what's uh, almost taxonomize kind of the you know the the research frontiers of optimization like how are how are folks thinking about what are the interesting open questions in optimization what i'd say is i think that there is uh there is a, a division of the optimization community and for the record it lives also within a lot of different communities. I think that a large chunk of people who would say they do optimization and do research on optimization live purely within mathematics departments. They're thinking about what I would call sort of the classical mathematical optimization. And you're right, that predates machine learning, that predates statistics, that predates well, maybe not statistics, the concept, but at least the field of statistics starting, let's say, 1910 or something like that. So yeah, there, there are people who have been thinking about optimization since forever. Newton's method is optimization. So um, I think that you can, you can look at that and say that there is a, a massive field, a huge bunch of literature, continuing research, thinking about different implications of smoothness, uh, quasi-convexity, various different things. I think that you've got another branch of the community that is optimization, but thinks of it in terms of what's called mathematical programming. And those people may live in a math department, they may live in op operations research, Groups, uh, they uh, many different places can be thinking it is like about linear programming, dynamic exactly programming, right. stochastic programming, all those and, and quadratic programming, exactly right. Mixed integer, yep. nonlinear programming, and in yep. many cases, uh, you know, those people are sometimes addressing problems that may be very close to some of these problems that we might address with sample efficient methods, but the goal may be different. In the case of doing mixed integer, nonlinear programming, the goal may be prove that I have the answer. I, I have the answer with a perfect guarantee, or I have a answer which is within blank of the true answer with, with some guarantee or something like that. I think that, that both of those are sets of, of optimization. And then I think there's this, this topic maybe that we're working on now, which is more of uh, the, the, the quote unquote black box optimization community, which is a bunch of evolutionary algorithms. And of course, those evolutionary algorithms are, I think, very, often very poorly represented at ML communities, but are a massive bunch of literature and there's some outstanding work going on there right now uh, in the evolutionary field. And then you've got these uh, statistically motivated sample efficient optimization methods, which are probably the most common ones you'll see talked about uh, by, by myself and in some of the, the context of the literature that I'm referring to. I think obviously you're still seeing a huge amount of gradient descent literature in the 
NARPS community. So, so that's sort of the, the taxonomy that I'd split it on. Are you doing something that's in this, in this group here that is uh, gradient descent? Are you doing mathematical programming? Are you doing something evolutionary? Or are you doing something in one of these sample efficient categories, the Bayesian optimization category? Got it. Got it. And you, you mentioned NURPS. Are you, uh, you kind of up to date on some of the optimization conversations that are happening at NURPS? What does that look like? Yeah. And I think that uh, in particular, I can, I can characterize how I'm thinking about it, uh, especially a lot with the workshops. There's, there's a workshop mm -hmm. that is on optimization and ML. It's literally the name of the workshop. They've been having it for a long time now. A lot of great research going on there, but that is more focused on uh, either many of these gradient descent style methods or elements of mathematical programming. There are some articles in there that are on more of these sample efficient methods. In particular, I think uh, National University of Singapore had an article uh, or someone, someone from, I shouldn't say the university, someone from National University of Singapore had an article on uh, BO for uh, simulation, calibrating simulation models. That's what it was. So there is some amount in there, but in reality, that workshop, I definitely would say, is more focused on uh, the, the gradient, the stochastic gradient descent methodologies. I think that you're, you're seeing, though, a widespread of workshops right now, which are trying to take AI out of AI's community and get it out into other segments of the community. There's the ML for Physical Sciences, or ML and the Physical Sciences workshop. Uh, there's the one tackling climate change with machine learning, uh, one that's obviously not just very timely, but I think is a really exciting opportunity to get out of the AI world and immediately be helping things and, and having a positive impact. There's the um, AI for the sciences, or maybe it's just called AI for science um, uh, workshop as well, which you said, it sounds like, okay, ML for physical sciences, AI for science. What's the difference? I mean, in reality, I think this is just a sort of embarrassment of riches here. There's so many people doing so much great work that we have a lot of different workshops that are on, on close topics. And I think this is giving us a chance to really uh, encourage participation, not just by the people who have been doing this for a long time, but, the, but anybody, anybody who wants to get in the game, anybody who wants to be taking AI and putting a convolutional neural networks or uh, maybe uh, reinforcement learning and put them out in the world there, or people who want to be doing sample efficient stuff, the, the, the Bayesian optimization stuff. There's some great papers in some of these workshops on BO. Uh, I think there's one from some authors at, at Shanghai Jiao Tong uh, at the ML and the physical sciences workshop, trying to talk about uh, thermophotovoltaics, I think. Uh, there was a, uh, Carrie Ann Bergen, at the AI for Sciences uh, workshop, uh, she's I think part of a panel, but I mean she's been she's been doing good work recently, uh, especially trying to say, hey, how are we using ML to deal with earthquakes? Uh, mm -hmm. And as somebody who lives in Hawaii, something I'm very concerned about. I really want to make sure that we're dealing with earthquakes well. <laughs> so I just I love to see it. It's really exciting for me, and it's exciting to see people out there uh, taking advantage of ML in the sciences, but also specifically, yeah, the sample efficient optimization in the sciences out in the real world, making big things happen. I'm excited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so a pattern, the you know clear pattern here is that when you're trying to apply machine learning in ways that kind of interface with the physical world, um, optimization does would you is it too strong to say that optimization plays a bigger role or is more important than you know when you're optimizing you know ad revenue or something that's you know purely physical i'm sorry digital based i think i think um, everybody's led to have their own opinions about what's the most important thing the most exciting thing i know i personally find it incredibly exciting. And as I mentioned before, I didn't grow up in the ML community. I grew up doing theoretically applied uh, mathematics. And um, what we worked on back in the day was a few different things, in particular, some magnetohydrodynamics. Uh, and we're seeing, we're seeing even now nuclear fusion trying to, trying to bubble up, trying to be a little exciting right now. ML is playing a little bit of a role in that. I'm excited by that because, you know, it's, it's a, it's a moment right now. There's a moment where ML is starting to mature and it's starting to 
see its capabilities expand beyond, sure, yeah, let's say recommender systems. Now, the people working at whoever using these recommender systems, I am, I guarantee they are excited to make that money. They should be. That is, that is their job. I personally find it incredibly exciting to say, hey, let's get out there and deal with drug discovery, a place where sample efficient optimization, active search in particular, has been really exciting so far. I love the idea of dealing with construction and how to make construction more environmentally friendly. There are versions of that problem that can be addressed with sample efficient optimization. And in particular, as we see more and more fields moving away from maybe the, the classical way of doing business, where it's just an expert tells you this is what you do and then you do it, and saying, now let's use a data-driven approach. And in particular, let's explore the space of possible options we have to find the one that works the best. That's where sample efficient methodologies is going to play a big role. That's where things like Bayesian optimization are going to play a really, really, really big role. Because when you're talking about new strategies for uh, construction or new, new flows for a canal, or how to deal with uh, displacement of wildlife or, or any number of different things. We talked about solar panels before. I had to best design solar panels that are as uh, energy efficient as possible. These are problems that can take, I mean, for some of these things, uh, you're talking about days, weeks, months to test some of these hypotheses. You need to do as much as possible in the computer at first. And even those simulations, those numerical simulations can be on the order of hours or days to run these climate simulations that are being run at NCAR right now. Uh, you're talking about months for some of these simulations to try and predict the impact of, of additional rainflow and, or rain, rainfall in certain parts of the world or something like that. So you really need the sample efficient methodology so as to help guide what is going to be put into production in the eventual real version of the world, what we're actually going to go out and test. Because you only have so many shots at that. You only If each of those tests that you're going to run is going to take a year, three years, five years, or something like that. You really need to have the right guidance to put that in play. And that's, for me, that's where the optimization, the Bayesian optimization, the active learning, the sample efficient methodologies are just going to play a, a massive role. And you're already seeing it at the workshops right now. You're starting to see it, uh, especially in uh, these application journals, in each of these fields, you're seeing articles being published, Bayesian optimization, intelligent ML, sample efficient ML, a surrogate assisted optimization for uh, construction, for manufacturing, uh, for safety, for, for vehicles. Uh, you're seeing it all over the place. And it's just, it's a, it's a great time. It's a great time to be in the field. I think we have a chance to do some really cool stuff. And, and I'm lucky to be a part of a company that wants to be a part of that. I think I ran into that name collision overloading of optimization again and in, in asking that question. You know, what I was trying to point at is there's this application of sample efficiency. You've got some machine learning problem. You want to optimize that problem. You know, hyperparameter optimization is a way to do that. You want to do that as efficiently as possible. There's an element of sample efficiency there. Um, and that's applicable whether you're dealing with, you know, the ad optimization problem, you know, pure digital or not. Then there's this other type of problem that the, again, for lack of a, a clearer way to articulate this, uh, seems to be highly correlated with real world uh, and expensive experimentation. And I'm thinking of my recent interview with Kim Branson, who's the global head of AI at GlaxoSmithKline. And he, you know, the thing he's most excited about them having built is uh, this data driven experimentation process because they can't just run all the experiments. It's too, exper it's too expensive. So they have to use data to guide the way, you know, to guide their scientists, you know, work in the lab. And, and that's a, it's a different, it's still sample efficiency, but it's a different kind of sample efficiency. It's, you know, it's kind of this, you know, exper intelligent experimentation is one way to, to think about it. Um, it's, in a sense, it's, uh, yeah, I'm wanting to like, think about it in terms of the relationship between, I want to think about it like 
on this side, maybe ML is the front end and optimization is the back end. And here optimization is the front end and ML is the back end. I don't know if that is a... what I would say is, and in, in this case, maybe there is a, a bit of a back end front end relationship. Obviously, I have no idea what the outstanding researchers at GlaxoSmithKline are working on in, sure. internally right now, but I'm going to you know, not dissimilar from the materials problem. I think exactly right. I think exactly yeah. right. And I think that um, there's there's not a there's not a massive sort of disconnect here between how this ML model is being built. And, and optimization, the question is, how is this ML model then sort of being used? And let's say you have some sort of ML model talking about uh, different design methodologies, or, and I think for many of these uh, sort of traditional engineering fields, what you have is not an ML model, what you have is probably a, a PDE simulation, a differential equation simulation, some mm -hmm. sort of uh, computational simulation which for them is maybe taking taking the place of this ML model that somebody else may have to construct in the absence of any of these ab initio principles that guide the development of a PDE model or some maybe some sort of stochastic simulation. So uh, in both of those circumstances, though, the question is, how do you use that model to tell your your people in the wet lab, your people out there going the construction, hey, why don't you try this next? What is the next best thing to try? What is the what is the best possible thing to try? So so you are still using maybe an ML model which is meant to predict how two chemicals are going to interact with each other, or you're using your numerical simulation to predict, hey, I've designed this airplane wing. This is how much turbulence it's going to generate, or something like that. And mm -hmm. you use this, and and you you conduct your I think Bayesian optimization on the outcome of these ML models to say, hey, here is what the, the next best thing to go out and actually build is. Here's, here's the, the one or three or five things to spend the next year manufacturing and testing right. under the hope that one of them is going to end up being the winner. So maybe yeah. to some degree, there's a, a bit of a multi-scale element here. You've got your ML model that takes time to build, but then predictions from it can come quickly. Same thing with the numerical simulation. Predictions from that can come quickly or at least faster than the actual manufacturing process. So you run your optimization, I think, oftentimes on the, the outcome of the ML model or on the outcome of your numerical simulation. And that guides you to, hey, this is what you should spend the next year doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, very cool stuff. Very, very cool stuff and helped me kind of think through maybe, I don't know, this interview maybe more than, than some others is kind of me trying to reconcile a lot of conversations I've had recently. And I appreciate you, uh, participating in that with me. Sir, it's my pleasure. And, uh, you know, I absolutely love talking about this topic and I especially love being able to talk with you about this topic. <laughs> All right, Mike. Hey, thanks so much. Um, and uh, appreciated you coming on the show and sharing with us. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity.